There are a million ways to make a living as a musician. This series is dedicated to exploring those paths with musicians that walk them in order to give you and your students some perspective on the opportunities in the music industry. Today I interview Head of Drums and Percussion at Midcoast Music Academy, member of Dom Famulero's 100 Best Drum Educators list, and co-founder of Musicians Notepad, Drew Weber, on this episode of So You Want to Be a Drummer. Drew! Otto! <laughs> <laughs> you're you're in the room with me. You're physically here. Yeah, you're, it's great. You're in Michigan. It's great to be back in the uh, home offices of the Musicians Notebook. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, yeah, it's good to have you here. So you want to be a drummer? I hope to be a drummer. Okay. One of these days. Yeah. Uh, so in this series, you know, the whole point is that we're talking about the fact that there's a bunch of different ways to be a drummer and that there's not one way to do it. Um, so tell us about how you were a drummer. At this point, I'm primarily you know, making the majority of my income teaching. Mm -hmm. And of course, playing all the time too. But, uh, you know, over the years, there's been times where there was more playing than teaching. And a lot of the time it was sort of balanced, you know, half and half. So currently, um, I'm the head of drums and percussion at a, the Mid Coast Music Academy in Rockland, Maine. Mm -hmm. Still playing, I would say, you know, this year, you know, maybe like 50, 60 jobs a year. Mm -hmm. which is extremely low for me. I mean, it's typically, mm -hmm. you know, many years of like 100, 150, that range, you know, playing. This summer in particular, there's been an unbelievable number of like one-offs, special events and functions and things that are either annual or one-time only kind of stuff. Play with one band one day, different band the next day, different band the next day. Um, and that's a lot of fun, but it also, you know, can be a challenge to kind of Make sure you've got time in there to prepare for the tunes and the music you're going to have to play and that kind of thing. Right, that's a lot more um, work on, on that right. end. It's yeah. not like just playing with the same group all the time and, and moving around with them, but you know. What's the, uh, what's the teaching scene out there like? Well, like anywhere, there are some music stores and they'll have, uh, you know, guitar lessons and vocal lessons and, mm -hmm. you know, just piano and that kind of thing. Um, but then where I work is actually like a music school. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, it's based on private lessons, but we offer classes and all these mm -hmm. different programs. So um, we follow a school calendar. Mm -hmm. So we run September through June. And then in the summer months, we have a variety of like a summer session that's still offering lessons over the summer mm -hmm. for people who want to continue through the summer. Yeah. And also uh, a number of camps that we do. And again, just things that only happen in the summer. Mm -hmm. Being more of a school, it's more of a Monday through Friday kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Not really like a music store gig where you, you know, Saturday's the main day. And, okay. You know. yeah. yeah, it's definitely my busiest day. How has your career taken you to be head of a music, you know, the drum portion of music school in, uh, in, in Rockland, Maine? In the Northeast. Yeah. Um, well, man, you know, obviously I've, I've been playing and teaching for years, 22 years in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. um, I've got this little sort of Nashville connection because I've got a lot of friends in Nashville, spent a little time down there. Mm -hmm. And just through meeting people and finding out about opportunities, uh, I've got family in the Northeast between, you know, a, a friend recommending me to the Music Academy who at that time, hey, we might need a drum guy, mm -hmm. um, to family kind of looking into that, you know, when there was a, an offer, you know, I just went ahead and decided to go with it, check it out. So I've only been there for about a year and a half now. But uh, so that's been really, really fun kind of refreshing and you know again as an educator after doing working on a drum shops forever as much as I love that mm -hmm. I love a, the school environment that I'm in now and being able to do more mm -hmm. classes and group stuff than I was doing before mm -hmm. when did drumming become the thing that supported you when when could you be just a drummer I started playing drums when I was about 11 and by the time I was 15 was when I was really thinking like oh man I don't, you know I want to do this for. I want to. I want to do this forever. I want this to be my my job. You know, right. make a career of it. Um, but of course, at that time, you're just kind of playing in bands with your friends, and and I was fortunate enough that my uh, parents took us on me and my sister on a you know summer vacation to New York City, and to me, a career in drumming before that time always meant touring the world in a tour bus and playing huge arenas. You know, mm -hmm. rock star kind of thing. Um, but all of a sudden, we went to New York, saw a Broadway show, went to Radio City Music Hall, and I was like, wait a minute, these, these are great drummers I'm seeing and hearing. And these guys are playing, you know, shows, and uh, that was the first time I really actually thought, wow, this, 
there's other ways to be a drummer other than just like a touring rock band. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I came back to Michigan, you know, that fall, um, I found out about a sort of a local theater company, which is not far from here, actually, now that mm -hmm. I'm back home. And they were putting on some shows and needed a, a drummer uh, to play. It was eight performances and three dress rehearsals that were paid. Mm -hmm. So 11 paid, you know, gigs, basically. Yeah. And I think I remember that it was like a flat 200 bucks. Okay. You know, wow. we'll give you $200 if you do these yeah. three dress rehearsals and eight shows. And I was thrilled. Amazing. I was like, man, I'm getting paid to play the drums. This is the coolest thing ever. Soon after that, I started playing maybe, you know, in groups that were actually getting more gigs and clubs and things like that. And then I, you know, decided to go to school for music and take that route. It wasn't really until after college that I started teaching privately and I was playing a lot more work in the business. So I would say I was probably 22, 23, where it was enough to you know, support myself. And mm -hmm. With a lot of people, it's like playing is like, I play in this band and this is what I do and that's what I want to do is just play in this band, mm -hmm. record, tour with these guys. And I, again, I really respect that. Um, I've only done a little bit of that. It's been a long time since I've really done like the original band mm -hmm. thing. Um, but for the most part, it's been a lot of years of just being a working drummer. Right. You know, mostly local stuff. Again, a lot of freelance stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've been a member of a specific band and at times for years. Mm -hmm. But generally, just like a working band whose purpose was to, to play locally, mm -hmm. you know, earn income from it and obviously have fun. But, yeah. Um, you know, in those situations where you're not really trying to sell product and you're not really trying to, you know, book shows in other cities and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When did you teach your first lesson? I uh, taught my first lesson in 1991. You know, it's funny, back then I, I kind of had this idea, and I think a lot of musicians did, a lot of drummers did, that teaching was just the thing that you did when you weren't playing. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you're, you're focusing on your playing career, but you know you play at night and you teach by day, so I kind of thought, hey, I gotta, I gotta have a teaching, gig. you know. So I went to the the closest drum shop in the area. The owner of the drum shop, who hadn't really been in business for very long, was a guy that I had actually taken lessons with myself mm -hmm. um, some years before that, and told him I was back in town from school, and you know, this is what I want to do. So um, he set me up with. You know, hey, come in on Saturday and, you know, we'll have a student for you. Yeah. Um, it wasn't long after that that I really realized, wow, teaching is a whole different thing. That's not just something you do by day. It's it's literally its own career and its own, uh, has its own requirements, responsibilities, you know, challenges. Right. And uh, I really loved it. I really just thought, wow, this is, this is really cool. So I really put a lot of time into trying to build the teaching roster and build the the lesson program at that particular drum shop. Mm -hmm. How does one do that? How does one build a teaching studio? You said you took a lot of, you know, that it was different than you thought it was going to be and that you put a lot into it. And I think it has really changed out there, but you're right, back in the day, teaching was this, like, everyone viewed it as a secondary thing. It's become a very popular thing now, which is... Oh, absolutely, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, Especially with, you know, yeah. the online mm -hmm. lessons and that avenue and all right. the possibilities with that. Back then, of course, this is sort of before... Uh, you know, cell phones or smartphones, and before we had, so there's no apps and there was no iPads, and you know, we didn't have uh, to where everyone today has a laptop. You know, that was mm -hmm. that wasn't happening back then either. So um, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, resources in terms of you know showing students interactive things that they can work with or even access to music, other than what they were listening to or or what you were telling them to go out and buy, or you can. You can borrow this cassette, kid, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, even teaching books. I mean, there were just a small handful of books back then, and so those were the, those were the go-to, those, those were the books that everybody used. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being sort of naive enough to think that lessons were going to go exactly how they went for me when I was a student. <laughs> right. You know, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to teach these, you know, young people that I had, beginners, exactly what I was taught and how I was taught and it'll be great, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you learn really quick, like, oh wow, they they don't like the same music that I like <laughs> and they don't learn things as quickly. They maybe learn this much, 
you know, faster than I did, but they're not even interested in this other thing that I thought was really cool. You know? Yeah. So it doesn't take long before you realize, like, wow, everybody, every student is completely different. Mm -hmm. Have their own level that they work at, you know, their own level of interest, their own. Yeah, yeah level of interest. Sorry, I just want to stop on that real quick. Is is a really important one because I think the reason that we're drum teachers is because we really liked drumming, and which meant we went home and we practiced and all that. Right. And the average student, you know, they're probably interested and they probably, you know, do it, but it's not, not like we did. You know, we ended up as drummers because we were the ones that just, you know, loved it more than anything right. else. We, we couldn't you know. wait to practice and we didn't have to be told to practice and, mm -hmm. you know, I was always the kind of student that, you know, like, teacher wanted me to practice this page out of the book and mm -hmm. I wanted to accomplish that page so I could sort of look ahead and right. like, oh man, I want to get to the next stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I've always said that the, the best students are the students that do what you want them do, to do and do what they want to do. Like, you get, right. students, you get yeah. students that do only the stuff you tell them to, you get students that do stuff that don't do, you know, that don't do, do the, the stuff you want them to, um, then you get students that don't do anything, but the best students are the ones that do what you want them to and the stuff they want to too or you know maybe they don't accomplish everything you give them but like there's a little bit of everything going on you know that's the best so yeah i remember I, how surprised i was when my first couple of students you know they would come back after a week and i could tell they hadn't even opened the book or thought about mm -hmm. practicing anything and i just thought wow I, why not you know i don't know isn't don't you like this you know mm -hmm. so then you immediately go well how can i connect with this person and give them something that they're interested in or enthused about that they're going to want to play or maybe I can explain it differently that you know than the way that I learned it that'll make it easier for them to understand or a little bit more inspirational or you know mm -hmm. engaging that they'll actually want to work on that so then I began to really enjoy that part of teaching when I realized wow everybody's so completely different I don't know you know which students are going to want to go with this method and materials and which students are going to go with that and that kind of thing and you know I remember back then too it was kind of uh the easiest way to to really promote lessons was literally putting up flyers at supermarkets and <laughs> right. you know obviously going to the local schools and talking to the band teachers and saying hey mm -hmm. you know I teach in the area and you know I'd love to work with your students and I will support your program and mm -hmm. help you know the kids with the music that you you're working on you know not just like give me students man mm -hmm. you know not that it's really that much different now as far as that part of it but I mean you certainly don't have Again, social media to advertise and that kind of thing. Uh, back then, it was kind of like either somebody saw you playing and said, "Hey, you know, you give lessons," or you know, maybe they just happened to go to the drum shop or something. But most of the time back then, it was literally somebody going into the the store to inquire about, you know, we want to play the drums. You know, and I don't know. I just think it's a lot easier to advertise it and a lot easier to to sort of give little promotional things that somebody can see without necessarily meeting you or, or going to you in person. Um, I was sort of fortunate that um, when I started teaching, the drum shop that I taught at was relatively new. So I was kind of like the first teacher. Mm -hmm. And then it was easy for me, you know, anyone who was coming in was being placed on my schedule. And then next thing you know, there was enough students to hire a second teacher, and a third and a fourth, and really develop that program mm -hmm. and that area. And it was a lot of fun. Just that, you know, camaraderie and, mm -hmm. and the, that's where the whole, really the idea of, you know, musicians notepad first began. You know, when you're working right. with other music teachers and you're talking after work or in between students about how I can reach this person or, you know, what kind of approach are you using on this particular topic mm -hmm. or what materials are you using? Again, always trying to be a better teacher and a little bit more mm -hmm. knowledgeable about the the materials that are out there or methods or you know all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. what would you recommend to you know young up-and-coming players you know that want to make a run at being a drummer you know it really depends I mean if, if the goal again is you know goal a is I want to be a you know touring performing recording you know drummer then <clears throat> for someone like that I would say you, you've got to absolutely be you have to be playing. You got to be out there playing, even if you live in a relatively small area or a small city. You've got to go to where music is happening and find out who else is playing, who are the, the more popular bands or musicians in your area, and and just get involved in the scene, see what's going on there, and and let people know that you're, you know, I want to be playing. I'm looking for, 
you know, a situation, a band or people to, to play with. And, you know, sometimes that, it sounds really easy, but, you know, that very easily could require completely relocating. And you want to go where things are going on. And obviously that's why so many people are in Nashville, moving to Nashville. It is Music City. That's where people who want to play music and want to get to that level are going, you know. You know, it, it doesn't happen if you're just kind of hanging out in your basement and playing. People have to know who you are and you got to get out there and be playing to, for someone to know that you want to and that you're capable of it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole other, you know, on that level, I know players, you know, professional touring drummers, and to get to that level, there's a whole other mindset and focus and sort of, you know, you just got to be really committed to that, like 100, 110%. The other thing, though, is, you know, in, in my situation, um, you know, I kind of look back at, at different points over the last 25 years and go, wow, at that point in my life, I really didn't do that there. I really, you know, if I'd gone this way and pursued that, maybe that would have been a better choice for me, you know, than the one that I made. But so you got to be realistic about what you're actually doing. You know, I remember when, when teaching became really important to me. I certainly never, I wouldn't say, like, gave up the dream, you know, but at the same time, I became a little bit more realistic about how, you know, I'm kind of looking to make a living as a drummer, teaching and playing. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I'm not putting 100%, like I said, 100, 110 into that goal, I'm not going to get there. So you have to be realistic about what you're trying to do. The one thing that I think is really important for everybody to know is that I've, what I've seen over the years a lot of times is everyone has that, that what we're calling goal A or that high-end mm -hmm. goal. And if they fall short of that, then they sort of like go, oh, I guess I'm not going to be able to be a drummer. You know, I'm gonna... And of course, you have to have some sort of income and sustain mm -hmm. living and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, I think it's really important for people to know that you know, if it doesn't work with this particular band, it doesn't mean it can't work with somebody else or another situation. In fact, you know, a lot of us are playing with our friends. We've got bands. We're thinking like, oh, this is great. We're going to play together forever. We're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be like the next Stones or, you know. Right. Um, and, you know, when a couple years down the road, one guy's like, hey, man, you know, I got a great career opportunity taking a job over here or, you know. I'm not, I'm not really into the music thing anymore. Mm -hmm. and before you know it, that band that you thought, we've been together since we were teenagers, and we this is what we know, this is what we do. Right. That kind of falls by the wayside. And, you know, if you if you still want to play, you just keep working, keep, you know, playing playing with other people and keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm saying, though, is that, you know, never th you should never think that, you know, if one situation ends, that the whole thing is, is done. Mm-hmm. Get back out there and try to find other situations. In fact, you know, one of the things a lot of drummers, uh, I guess musicians, I should say, really don't like about the music business, you're constantly hired and fired, and you know, somebody might hire you for one gig, mm -hmm. and then that, you know, that's all you were hired for. That's it. Other times it might be we need you for a month. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it depends on the situation. But a lot of uh, a lot of musicians really can't stand that kind of you're no longer playing with us, you know, we, we've got somebody else. Or, you know, I know you mm -hmm. recorded the, the record, but we want to use somebody else live, you know. Right. Um, and I've been in situations where I was the live guy, but not the guy on the CD. Mm -hmm. And then I've been opposite of that, where yeah. we want you to record the disc with us, but we're going to use this other guy when we tour, you know. Yeah. Um, and you just, again, you just get used to that. Mm -hmm. um, phones are going to be ringing enough that you have other op opportunities or other choices you know mm -hmm. to play with other people along the way being a drummer there's the playing part of it and then there's the whole business side of it. you got to be a business person um, all along you got to be able to deal with other people personally and you know socially and you have to be able to do your own marketing marketing and promotion and you know all that kind of stuff um, and as we always always hear in every interview with any musicians that so much of it has to deal with just people I mean, you might be an incredible drummer, but if people don't want to hang out with you, they're, they're not going to hire you. They're not, they don't want you to be in their band if they don't think you're a cool guy to, to hang with, especially if you're in a situation where you're doing any traveling or, you know, mm -hmm. extensive time together. You know, if they can't stand you, they don't want to, you know, be in a van with you for, mm -hmm. you know, months on end. So, you know, you sometimes really have to work on that if you're 
um, sort of new to the business or new to, to that idea. You know, you spend all your time practicing and playing and maybe never really thought about your you know, personal skills and social skills and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. You just have to be able to accept the fact that, you know, I wasn't the right drummer for that situation. And you just kind of, every, every playing situation or every teaching situation, they're all, you know, learning experiences. So if you play with a group and it, it comes to an end or they don't hire you back, like you said, you kind of take a look at it and go, what, what might I have done differently or what, what were they looking for? What kind of player would I have had have to be to, you know, keep that gig or get the next call from them? And again, sometimes you don't want it. Sometimes you're like, oh, that's not really my thing. That's not really who I am. So, you know, that, and again, that's okay. Right. There's, there's always going to be other musicians out there um, that do want to play with you and do like what you do. So, you know, you don't throw in the towel so easily. You just kind of, and the, I really feel like that's kind of what's helped me sustain a career at this is, uh, you know, first of all, as a player, I wanted to be versatile and be able to play a lot of different things. You know, I'm not just a rock drummer or just a jazz drummer. And that's a challenge in itself. If you want to, you know, play things with some authenticity, you know, you have to really work at that. But um, just always being open to, you know, well, I'm not playing with those guys anymore. That's okay. I'm playing with this band now or I'll, you know, just keep on working that angle but again you have to really let people know that I want to play I'm available to play you know and just be out there well I think that's as good a place as any to, to end it Drew thanks for coming all the way to Michigan <laughs> <laughs> absolutely to, to, to sit down with us thanks for having me Jeremy yeah let's hit it <laughs>